Good evening. My name is Nicole Zatlin, and I am thrilled to welcome you all here this evening. Now, I'm first going to make a request, which is if everyone could move on in. We are expecting a full house tonight, so if you could just scooch on in, that would be fantastic. Um, so everyone can take part tonight. I have a very unique honor, and that is to introduce our speakers, Barbara Lee and Ava Raspini. Ava is the Barbara Lee Chief Curator of the ICA. She joined our museum in February of 2015. In her previous position as curator in the photography department of the Museum of Modern Art, she organized exhibitions including Cindy Sherman and Robert Heineken, as well as focusing on acquisitions. Here at the ICA, she brought us Waleed Rod, Nalini Milani, and Liz Deshane. Ava, along with Dan Byers and Ruth Erickson, is creating a forward-looking program of art and ideas from across the globe. Barbara Lee is a fearless leader, philanthropist, and activist. In all of her work, she leads by example, dedicating her time, experience, intelligence, and resources to advancing women's equality and representation in American politics and in contemporary art. The ICA is a testament to her mission. We have a woman director, and I believe without, we would not have Jill without Barbara. We had a woman architect in Elizabeth Diller. From Jessica Morgan to Helen Molesworth to now Ava, we have championed, nurtured, and helped develop strong women in the arts. And now, now, we have the Barbara Lee Collection of Art by Women that makes the ICA one of the only museums in the country that has a collection with a majority of work by women. <laughs> the collection is comprised of major works by some of the most iconic artists of the 20th and 21st centuries. century. Louise Bourgeois, Kara Walker, Lorna Simpson, Cindy Sherman, and many others, and includes painting, sculpture, and photography that investigate key themes and ideas in contemporary art and culture. This work has changed the course of art history. Please join me in welcoming Barbara Lee and Ava Raspini. Thank you, Nicole, for that wonderful introduction. And thank you, all of you, for being here tonight. I am thrilled and delighted to be here with Barbara Lee, longtime ICA trustee and visionary collector and philanthropist. And I'm also pleased to be celebrating First Light, a decade of collecting at the ICA with all of you tonight. Before we begin the program, I'd like to say a few words of thanks. First of all, thank you to the donors. No, those are not the donors, that's the art. These are the donors. Um, thank you to the donors. Uh, we have had incredible support for this exhibition from Christie's, the National Endowment for the Arts, Fiduciary Trust Company, and numerous individuals. And truly, we couldn't do this with all, without all of you. Every exhibition is the result of collaboration, but this exhibition was particularly collaborative. Every single curator in the department, that's five of us, worked on this exhibition, and I would like to acknowledge uh, their contributions. Mannion family senior curator Dan Byers, associate curator Ruth Erickson, and curatorial assistants Jeffrey Deblois and Jessica Hong. And we together would like to salute the regist registrars and the installation team that help us install this exhibition. And on behalf of the whole museum, I would like to thank the artist for the gift of their work and for the pleasure of entrusting their work to us for preservation for future generations. Today we're celebrating several milestones. We're celebrating 10 years of this uh, being in the spectacular building on the waterfront, 10 years of being a collecting institution, but we're also celebrating our 80th year. In 1936, the ICA was founded, and we are now one of the oldest museums dedicated to the art and ideas of our time. Since 1936, we've had 13 different homes, and here you see one of them 
uh, from 1963. We've had hundreds of ex exhibitions dedicated to some of the leading artists, architects, and performers of our time. Founding director, excuse me, Founding director James Sachs Plout declared the ICA an experimental laboratory for contemporary art. And here you see him. He is on the right. This is one of my favorite pictures of him. He is greeting a courier that was coming from Mexico, bringing canvases for the exhibition of Mexican modern painters in 1941, which included work by Frida Kahlo and Diego Rivera. The ICA has remained radically loyal to this ethos of experimentation. In 1940, we exhibited Pablo Picasso's Guernica, a masterpiece that he painted in 1937 that was an anti-war statement, and this was shown at the height of World War II. Indeed, quite a statement by the ICA. We have shown some of the most important uh, thinkers and visual artists, architects of our time. In 1966, we had a exhibition of Andy Warhol very early in his career. And we also have had a steadfast uh, dedication to performers and performing arts. It's very much part of our DNA. We have always uh, identified some of the most forward-thinking artists of our time, uh, shows with artists such as Cindy Sherman very early in her career, and also taking risks, in this case, uh, presenting an exhibition of Robert Maplethorpe at the height of the debates around censorship due to the homoerotic content of his art. We have shown some of the artists and dedicated some uh, exhibitions to some of the artists that are on view upstairs, such as Nan Golden and Carol Walker early in their careers. And continuing in our new building, we have uh, sought to represent voices from all over the globe and continued the ethos of experimentation both inside the building and outside. And finally, most recently, we have looked backwards to the past with Black Mountain College to understand the issues of our time. I love this picture. <laughs> So 10 years ago, due to the great vision of our director, Jill Medvedow, we opened this spectacular new building on the waterfront, and we began a new chapter. We, we lost some parking along the way, though. <laughs> 10 years ago, we became a collecting institution. We decided to collect as a way to create a sense of permanency and the opportunity to give some historical grounding to the very forward-thinking exhibitions that we create. First Light, a decade of collecting, is a way of looking back and looking forward. It's the most expansive collection exhibition to date. There's some 100 works on view by more than 60 artists. Building a collection is the collective work of many people, curators, museum directors, and individuals who give their art to be enjoyed by a larger public. Every museum's collection, if you look back at their history, is seated by a few individuals, a family, or in the case of European museums, it's most often a royal patron. And over time, a collection broadens and expands, reflecting the many points of view, expertise, and enthusiasms of curators, directors, and patrons who come and go. One of the individuals who's been the most influential in the formation of ICA's collection is Barbara. She was an early advocate for the ICA to become a collecting institution, and the Barbara Lee Collection of Art by Women has led the way for others, has galvanized others to support our growing collection. Over the last two years, Barbara has made two major gifts to the museum of her collection, a total of 69 works by 36 artists and a selection of this collection is on view as part of First Light. There's one simple rule, one guiding principle for this collection, art by women. Beyond that, there's great diversity and plurality, works by artists of different generations, nationalities, and works in a range of mediums. Barbara has collected historical artists, such as the sculptor Eva Hesse, as well as younger voices making an impact today, such as the painter Dana Schutz. There's a, a diversity of mediums in the collection, from drawing and painting to video and photography. But nevertheless, there are certain themes and threads that emerge in this collection. It's distinguished by significant holdings of sculpture, 
artists that have tackled and redefined sculpture making in the last 40 years. There are works that address and picture the female body, <coughs> ideas about gender, and explore the complexities of identity. There are works that speak to trauma, violence, and social injustice. It was a great honor to work with this collection, and I really got to know it this summer by installing it in First Light. And really, it's my great pleasure to be here with you tonight, Barbara, and to talk about the evolution of your collection and the work in it. So let's begin the conversation by talking about your steadfast commitment and vision to support women, both in politics and the arts. How did you start collecting, and what was the first work you bought? So the first work I bought uh, was uh, when I was a senior in high school, and it was a Picasso, Picasso lithograph um, that was a, turned out to be a peace poster, uh, which I had no idea at the time that, that, it, that it was. That was his mission. Mm -hmm. um, and as you can see from the image, I'm hoping that's behind yep. me, you know, that it is, uh, you know, two, these two hands kind of reaching out almost towards each other and grasping this very, uh, very, you know, wild, colorful group of flowers. And, uh, and the, the, the fact that it actually was a peace poster, you know, kind of spoke to who I was then and also really who I have remained and grown even more into that identity of, of being a social justice advocate. Mm -hmm. So how did you begin collecting work by women? So that is so fascinating. Um, I, the ICA was absolutely instrumental in my decision to collect art by women. And uh, back in um, 1994, I, and I joined the board in 1990, and in 1994, um, um, I saw a ICA uh, exhibition of the Gorilla Girls. And it, uh, it was my first introduction to them, um, even though they had been making art since the mid-1980s. And, uh, and, this po and the poster, you know, do women have to be naked to get into a museum, <laughs> completely, you know, kind of registered in my consciousness about all of the, you know, all of the pieces that, uh, that in which women are objectified in the course of art history. And, uh, and that is really how I began to start to think about art by women. Um, and, um, and, uh, and it just it kind of resonated so deeply with me and has been part of my, part of my history. I actually went to their big anniversary um, uh, last spring in New York City. You were an early advocate for the ICA to begin collecting. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that and why you felt so strongly? Yeah. So um, back again, in, it was also in the mid-1990s uh, when we... Um, decided that uh, we really needed to kind of rethink the kind of in strategic planning, kind of what was the ICA going to be in the future. We'd had this great history that Ava had explained to you uh, at where we were you know, exhibiting groundbreaking work right from the beginning. Um, and, um, uh, and what happened was that people didn't remember the history of the ICA or remember these important stories that were told because they got lost in the archives. And so I was one of the, the most staunch advocates for um, uh, hiring Jill, uh, uh, building a new museum, and, um, and uh, this amazing um, place on the waterfront, and also becoming a collecting institution. And one of the reasons for that was because people love coming back to see things they have seen before. And, uh, and I think those pieces kind of anchor people's ideas when they think about a museum. Mm -hmm. You promised Cornelia Parker's hanging fire to the ICA before we actually were a collecting institution. And this has now become one of the icons of our collection. Can you tell us what about this work spoke to you? Yes. So Cornelia's work was also something that I learned about at an exhibition uh, at the ICA, and many of you may remember uh, a, a big exhibition where, um, where uh, Cornelia ran over, took a big tractor and ran over silver plate uh, serving dishes and teacups and uh, water pitchers and suspended them in the air. And it was just such an amazing um, entire installation to walk in and around the sculpture. It was 
completely amazing. And then shortly after that, I went uh, with the ICA on a trip to London, and we went to the gallery that showed her work. And, um, and again, I saw this piece called Hanging Fire, Suspected Arson. Um, and, uh, and again, it reminded me so much of the amazing uh, first installation. And, um, and I bought it kind of as what I called an, to myself an aspirational piece. I bought it with the hopes that the ICA was going to vote to become a collecting institution. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I had no idea what I was possibly going to do with it uh, if, you know, if, 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 if that didn't happen. So, um, so in any case, uh, you know, it is an amazing piece. Uh, and I think it is a piece that people love coming back to see. Uh, and, um, and, you know, for me, the, the personal meaning of it um, is, you know, here is this building or shed that was destroyed by fire. And it, you know, and it here it has been transformed into this uplifting and, and um, visually arresting piece of art. And it's what kind of like what I call the phoenix, kind of rising out of the uh, ashes into beauty. And so mm -hmm. I think, again, it to, it's a testament to the human spirit. Mm -hmm. Well, as, as we talked about, the ICA has had a great history of promoting and supporting women artists. And you've talked about how you have grown and, and learned as a collector alongside the ICA. And I understand the 1996 exhibition, Inside the Visible, which included a lot of women artists uh, and sort of unknown women artists in that was a kind of benchmark for you. And your collection now, a lot of the core artists in your collection, which include Ava Hesse, and Anna Mendieta and Nancy Spiro, and here's Anna Mendieta that was in the show Inside the Visible. Can you tell us how your collection evolved with the ICA? Yeah. So, uh, so why don't I talk a little bit more first about kind of, uh, kind of what I had been collecting. Uh, my mother-in-law had been a prominent art collector and art uh, lithographic dealer in Boston. And I collected, uh, and kind of the whole family collected kind of uh, things that, uh, that she um, uh, was attracted to and, and actually sold herself as a dealer. And, um, and, um, and a lot of those things were uh, really wonderful pop kind of artists from the 60s. Jasper Johns, uh, Larry Rivers, Robert Rauschenberg, um, and, um, and I ended up kind of moving away from that, kind of once I saw this Inside the Visible, which was an exhibition totally dedicated to women. And again, after the Gorilla Girls, so this was the, first, the next big, big moment in my life to see that exhibit. And I moved from collecting what I called iconic images of women by artists uh, like, um, like um, Lucian Freud and Andy Warhol and Lichtenstein to iconic images made by women, which included most, you know, kind of predominantly sculpture. Mm -hmm. um, and so, um, so anyway, the, I wanted to say a couple of things. Like, even the, the, these women all were in this Inside the Visible uh, exhibition. I had never seen the work of any of them prior to that exhibit. And it was just a monumental shift in my, in my growth. And, um, and it was at the same time that I was so, uh, you know, getting so involved in thinking that more, electing more women to public office um, was, gonna, was so important. My foundation does nonpartisan research about electing women. And so it was just a real shift, a natural shift for me to move my art collection into the kind of same arena as, as my uh, foundation and uh, work to empower more women, uh, both in art and politics. Wonderful. Uh, one of the great things about your collection is that you've dedicated yourself to artists and collected some of them in depth. And specifically, Louise Bourgeois is someone you have collected in great depth. How did you come to collect her work? Yep. So that was very interesting. Again, I saw her work for the first time um, uh, in, an, in a gallery. Well, actually, I saw her first time work at actually Inside the Visible. Uh, and then uh, the first time I saw it in a, uh, a gallery was um, also in the mid-1990s. And I had the opportunity, after visiting the gallery, to be invited to go to see her work in her studio. And uh, it was absolutely shocking to me uh, her, her studio 
was cram-packed with work from every decade of her career, going back to this late 1930s, kind of all the way up to the mid-1990s. And, uh, and it wasn't very expensive. She was totally undervalued in uh, at the way so many women are undervalued. And, um, and I just was prompted and, uh, to uh, basically pick a work from almost every decade. Uh, and, um, and it was just such an amazing experience. Um, and then uh, one of, my, one of the, my most wonderful art collecting highlights was when um, Jill Medvedal and I went to see Louise at her home. It turned out that, uh, that uh, Jill had been Louise's office assistant while she was in graduate school. And she, she helped uh, to organize Louise's books and her papers and her archives. And she also went, uh, she also went to go get people ice cream. <laughs> and, uh, and, and would you believe when Jill and I went and spent the afternoon with Louise, who actually wouldn't let us leave, um, sure enough, she had her, her uh, office assistant go and get us ice cream. <laughs> So anyway, and Lu Louise didn't want to talk about her art at all, all the, and, and really all she wanted to talk about was Jill and me and kind of, kind of what about our lives um, and uh, kind of into the nitty gritty. And, and that shows, again, so much about how Louise's art was so, uh, so connected to her own life history um, and, um, and the, the traumas and the joys and the, and the deep relationships that she had with people. Um, and so that is so typical of, of art by women, um, especially, uh, especially kind of after World War II, when men were, probably wanted to get away from this concept of, of um, war and terror and all the horrors that people had experienced and, and, and came up with these amazing ideas of abstract expressionism and then minimalism, and here were women talking about the issues that were affecting their lives uh, and, and um, you know, including kind of just everything, uh, kind of all the issues that, uh, that Ava referred to a few minutes ago. And the wonderful thing about our holdings of bourgeois, really, to great thanks to you, is that we have a really broad range of, of her work from, as you say, virtually every decade, from the 90s to these incredibly early works, which are on view in the galleries upstairs. Some of the works in the collection, as I mentioned in my introductory remarks, are politically charged, and they speak to the objectification of women, which you just touched on now. Can you tell me a little bit more about this and, and which works in particular speak to that and speak to that issue for you? Yes. So um, again, so that, uh, as I had said, in moving from collecting iconic images of women to iconic images by women, you know, I, this, these issues about women's identity in the world and women's, um, women's deep feeling about um, uh, wanting uh, safety for their families and, uh, and you know, whole, intact, loving families is, was, is such an important part. So um, uh, let me just see what you got. Oh, you have to get Ellen Gallagher. OK, so Ellen Gallagher also was in the Inside Visible exhibition and then later had her own exhibit at the ICA. And, um, and also had a Boston connection. Uh, and, um, and this particular piece uh, was so interesting to me uh, because uh, it's taken from uh, images of black women from Ebony Magazine and other black magazines. And, um, and, uh, and Ellen has pasted on kind of all these collaged elements. And, and it really refers to um, kind of um, and uh, again, you know, um, it really, I think, refers to how magazines, and this is true for other, you know, all magazines, not just these magazines, are always trying to present these idealized visions of women. And, like, and, and who can be that anyway, and, you know, no matter who you are? Um, and, um, and so that's what this, that's what this uh, image means to me. And uh, it's just kind of thrilling because of, I can picture as I'm talking kind of all the images that I can remember about Ellen Gallagher's from her, ex from her exhibits you know, over the years at the ICA. Mm -hmm. 
There's a couple of other works that you and I have talked about that are also about the sort of objectification or representation of women, um, some incredibly humorous and others more poignant. Are there any, I was, I was wondering perhaps about the Lorna Simpson, whether you wanted to talk yep. a little bit about that one. Yep, so again, so the Lorna Simpson, again, is very, very interesting about kind of putting right out there, you know, these, these plastic plaques, uh, you know, on, on the images that she took of, um, you know, that, that again, where she is so focused, again, on, on identity, on her identity as a, a black woman and how people also think about black women. And so, uh, you know, this is again my own personal, my own personal take on these, on these pieces. And what's so fascinating to me is I'm mostly interested in works that have an ambiguity, that are provocative, where the viewer comes up with their own definition and their own meaning of, of, of what, you know, of what it evokes in them. So everybody else, you know, will, can have different opinions and feelings about what it means. And, um, and that is kind of what is most compelling to me about art, is that you can make up your own story about what it means to you. And that is, uh, again, what has kind of captured my imagination. Well, staying on this theme of politically charged pieces, several of the pieces in the collection are, I think, very much a comment on discrimination, whether it's racial discrimination or gender discrimination. And I'm thinking about the monumental Carol Walker work, which is a kind of centerpiece of the exhibition as you walk in. It's the first thing you encounter. Can you talk about why this work and, and these kinds of works speak to you and what role they play in the national conversation about violence and social injustice? Right. So again, so Carol Walker, again, was one of our very early people that we showed after I came on to the ICA board. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so I had been very familiar with her silhouettes, kind of right, right, kind of right from when she kind of, uh, we, we got to know her here, and she then hit kind of the, the national and international art scene. And, um, and it's just like so fascinating, again, uh, especially at this painful moment in time with so much violence about how, um, you know, how she, with incredible uh, beauty, uh, you know, uh, shows extremely difficult, compelling, and, and uncomfortable scenes. And of course, she's wanting us to be uncomfortable, you know, but, and, but the art itself is very uh, beautiful, um, and, and as well as it is difficult. And this particular piece, which I saw a number of years ago, um, uh, when it first uh, when it first showed um, was fascinating to me because uh, she uh, included these tiny little watercolors uh, that you'll want to get up close to see. Mm -hmm. And so often with work like hers, you kind of need the distance to be able to step back and see the whole image. Um, but also these little tiny watercolors that are very delicate and uh, you know draw you in. So I'm hoping you will get up close to this piece. And my one other piece about this is that I had seen this image and was like, okay, wait, you know, this one is like way too big for my home. I guess I might have even thought it was, um, you know, uh, um, you know, and it certainly is a very provocative um, and difficult piece, as, and, as compelling as it is. And uh, Ava brought it to my attention because I'm always asking her to see things or uh, tell me about things that are particularly interesting out there. And, um, and so um, this is a piece that I bought especially, um, you know, at, at, um, at Ava's um, request to buy for the ICA. And I think this is the first time that uh, someone has actually stepped up to do that. And I think now there have been some other cases as well Absolutely. of other people coming forward to help build, you know, kind of this monumental collection. Yeah. Well, thank you for that. Yeah. Um, and, you know, on the theme of this kind of uh, violence and trauma, what's interesting about the collection is you also have artists that uh, speak to other geographies. So the Palestinian artist who's now, who grew up in Lebanon and lives in London, Mona Hatoum, and the Colombian artist Doris Salcedo also speaking about violence and trauma. Do you want to say anything about yep. those works? Yep. So let me just say a little bit. What's so fascinating to me about the Mona Hatoum, who is also an inside visible uh, <laughs> um, artist, um, is, is, is that um, 
if when you look at this piece, you can't tell quite what it is. It looks like it's Christmas ornaments or something very beautiful inside this like early 20th century uh, curio cabinet. And so the cabinet draws you in. And only when you get up close do you kind of get the horror of these beautiful Christmas balls that are actually grenades. And so it is, again, it's a protest against kind of the, the, you know, the atrocities of war. Um, and so that it was very compelling to me. And, uh, and I've actually seen, again, when in the galleries in the past, kind of um, uh, you know, families going up and looking at it and ch little children peering in. And it's a good thing that it has a glass front. So they're not trying to take the little, the little uh, Christmas ornament uh, grenades out. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other piece that also has comes also talks about trauma and uh, the atrocities of war uh, is Dara Salcedo. And, uh, and this image are, are actually shoes uh, from women who were disappeared uh, by, the, by all the terrorism um, that happened in Chile. And so again, it's very simple. It's very, uh, it's very minimalistic. Um, and um, um, and um, you know, and kind of beautiful and painful at the same time. Well, I do think there's great beauty in a number of the works that you collect, even though there is this kind of social relevance uh, to them, that there is also a material and formal beauty. And, and I think with Doris Salcedo, you see it, um, hopefully you see it even better in the flesh. Um, I have one final question for you, and I couldn't resist asking this. But what is the fav your favorite work in the collection? Um, so, uh, so uh, you know, so at each moment in time when I'm buying a piece, it's my favorite piece. <laughs> of <course>. <laughs> um, <laughs> and um, and I usually, I, I, I do want to say one thing. I usually will um, see something, and perhaps I've seen it, you know, in print somewhere, or sometimes the images will be sent to me, and I very often choose something that I. Um, see in person and can't get out of my head. And, uh, and, and so very often, um, if, I, if I wake up the next morning and I'm still thinking about a piece, I, you know, and I, if I haven't made the decision on the spot, I kind of go for it then. And, um, and um, I love the work of Marlene Dumas, who is, an, um, you know, who is uh, from South Africa and moved to the Netherlands during apartheid. And um, when I saw this piece, this was so shocking when Ava was giving her introduction. When I saw this piece for the first time, um, I, I just, uh, I welled up with tears. And the only time I had ever done that um, uh, before was the first time I saw Guernica that mm. Ava mentioned had shown early on at the ICA. And it, they both resonated so deeply with me. And in this particular case, um, you know, here are these gigantic skeletons, uh, and the panels, the skeletons are seven feet high, and so is this three-year-old little naked girl. And instead of looking like she is uncomfortable with being naked, you know, she is right out there, totally comfor comfortable with her nudity. And for me, this picture is a gap about uh, the a mother's fears about growing up in a in a world with violence and um, and um, and kind of the destruction of war and the fear of war, um, and here is this young girl who is like totally comfortable in her skin, standing there. It's almost like a victory pose. Uh, you know, uh, and I, I say all she needs is her Supergirl cape. Uh, mm -hmm. And um, and for me, again, this is about. Uh, the, what I would think is the, the resilience of the human spirit and the girl's, the girl's resilience and fearlessness in the face of her mother's fears. Well, that's a beautiful note to end on and a beautiful thought. Barbara, I want to thank yeah. you. Can I, can I say one more thing? Please. Okay. Yes. <laughs> Please. Well, while Please. I'm at this, Please so go. Um, I just, again, am so, uh, so thrilled to have bought these pieces mm. that have meant so much to me and to have been able to give them to the ICA where so many more people can enjoy them and appreciate them and, and think about how they resonate with their lives and with the lives of other people in the world. You know, that's what it means to me, kind of being a collector. And, uh, and it is just kind of really thrilling 
for me to, uh, to be able to have made this gift of these pieces that are so meaningful and powerful for me. And, uh, and I, am, uh, I am very grateful that the ICA is exactly the right place to have this because the ICA's whole purpose is really to uh, kind of, as Jill and Ava kind of have said, um, uh, you know, to, to be a community service, to help to think about the power of ideas in the world, and for us to be leaders in that in the community is absolutely thrilling for me. So thank you all. Wow. Thank you, Barbara.